Kia ora tālofa, and welcome to another episode of Playmakers, where each week we catch up with some of our past and present superstars. This week, I've got the pleasure of catching up with uh, Wellington, Hurricanes and All Black superstar, and most recently, uh, the Western Force, Jeremy Thrush. Thrushy, welcome to the show, mate, and thanks for, for coming on. How are you? Are you keeping safe over there in lockdown? Yeah, we are. Um, we're only here for four days. Uh, it's, it's not too bad compared to the rest of Australia at the moment. I think most of them have got about two weeks in lockdown. So hopefully that's it. Four days we can get back out. Mate, I was going to start with uh, that dirty slug of yours and the, and the mullet, but I've noticed you've actually chopped it off. Um, but we'll go there. I mean, what, what brought that about uh, in terms of uh, getting, that, getting that on board? Um, oh, it would have been last year, actually, the, in, in lockdown. Um, we were in for about maybe six odd weeks. I grew a beard and I was getting on a bit in age, so there's a fair few silvers coming through, so... And my wife wanted me to shave it off, so I, I shaved the mullet, and she didn't like it too much, so I, I held on to it for a little while. And then the mullet sort of took shape this year. It's sort of something all the young young guys are doing over here in Aussie, so I thought I'd uh, jump on board and, and, and try to keep my youth. I think it worked a little bit. I was going to say, mate, I thought that you'd, you'd fit right in there. There's a few bogans over there. They were, they were taking you on as one of their own, weren't they? Yeah, definitely the mullet, not so much the moustache. Uh, didn't get a lot of good comments from the moustache uh, from most people, but the mullet, uh, I definitely fitted in with the mullet. Mate, I, I want to um, start, I mean, obviously you're in, you're in Perth and you're with the Western Force, but you rolled the dice a little bit in 2018. They'd just been, you know, obviously kicked out of Super Rugby um, and there was talk of you going to Northampton or, or possibly to France. What, what, what? sort of made the decision to, to, to go to a place that wasn't going to be playing first-class rugby? Yeah, it was, it was. I guess it was kind of stepping into the unknown a little bit with, uh, I guess, who was still here from the force and, and what kind of uh, competition and experience that was going to take place with, with the rugby. Um, I kind of braced myself for, for that sort of situation and what was going to be ahead. Um, but I was actually... Uh, pretty surprised with how everything kind of went and um, really enjoyed myself for the first two and a bit years here with, with the competition what what the force were trying to do and what Andrew Forrest and, and Nicola his wife were trying to do with the competition of uh, global rapid rugby Mate, you've You've been to a lot of places as well, you know, in your, in your rugby career, you know, South Africa, obviously you we played for Gloucester and over in the UK, but you know, be playing against you know, teams in Malaysia and South China and obviously being able to experience that. How, how different was that in terms of your, I suppose, whole preparation and, and also the, the players that you were, you were playing against? Yeah, it was, it was, it was experience. I, I unfortunately didn't get to go to the Singapore game. I, I picked up an injury, um, but we, we had some good trips. Um, the boys went to Tonga and played Tonga before they went away to the World Cup. Nice. Um, and that was uh, an experience for the boys. I think a fair few of them got a bit of food poisoning and some sort of uh, stomach bug uh, on the way over and then on the way back. And it, it pissed down the whole time they were there in the game. So it was a bit of a tricky situation with the, the field being pretty flooded. Um, we had one game in Singapore that the humidity was, I don't know, it was as outrageous, but... <laughs> the boys, a couple of the boys passed out and catch and run before the game because of the heat. So there were a fair few experiences that yeah I hadn't come across before. But um, you look back now and, and talk to the lads are still here from those times. Um, they're pretty funny stories. Yeah, you, you have to say we've come a long way since since those days, which is pretty cool. I'll tell you what, yeah, you certainly have, and I, I suppose. You know, when you've gone through all that and then being, you know, reintroduced back into, um, you know, to Super Rugby AU first and foremost, and then, you know, the Trans Tasman. I mean, uh, how, you know, how, how, how awesome was that to be able to do that? And what sort of celebrations did you guys, you know, get into in terms of, you know, being, I suppose, you shunted out in one stage, but then being brought back? Yeah, it was, it was weird. I guess we had about six weeks of. Not, probably not as intense lockdown as uh, the Kiwis did, but um, we, uh, we, just, we just keep hearing rumours that we're, uh, last year that we're probably going to come back into some sort of Super Australian competition, um, Super Rugby Australian competition, and 
then when it came about, um, I guess from my point of view, there was a little bit of anxiety and seeing a football <laughs> running around and, and catching, catching some of these young fellas. And then it just sort of built and built within us that those guys that had stuck around that had been kicked out and, and stayed and wanted to make uh, the force a, a pretty a pretty strong team in Australia again. And I guess um, I guess they got the opportunity to do that uh, last year and then going ahead again this year, we, we've just, I guess, taken a step forward with getting a fair few more wins and pushing some of the Kiwi teams a bit further than probably team, uh, they probably expected us to. No, oh, mate, you, you certainly did. But from the outside, it looked like you had a real, you know, Awesome team culture, great team culture. Guys were getting along, and um, which is always kind of tough considering what you've just spoken about. Guys from different parts of the world are sort of seen as a made, made up team. But you went in there and you had songs in the changing room. We've all seen it the Aerosmiths and the, and the Adelas and stuff like that. And sometimes Kiwis go, go to a different place and they try to bring that sort of, um, you know, that sing, sing along sort of aspect to it. And all, all of a sudden there's a big flop. That wasn't the case for you guys. You guys, you really built it. I mean, how did that come come across? And uh, for, especially for the Aussie guys. Yeah. Well, it was actually um, Marcel Braki who, who came up. Like we had a team song, um, and then he decided at the end of uh, like the bit where you know our, our team song, we're going to sing a couple of uh, belters that most boys know, and <laughs> the first one was Adele. Uh, someone like you and it was everyone was kind of like a little bit unsure of how that was going to go at the end it was a, I guess you're normally doing a rah-rah like a bit, a bit of a chant song A few beers in the change room and arm and arm, and we got into it. And it was uh, awesome. We didn't realise it was going to take off like it did on on uh, your social media. Well, mate, it doesn't help when you got someone like Richard Cowie and his and his budgie smugglers, like <laughs> singing right at the top of his toad, mate. Hey, honestly, that's all he brought with him: suitcase of budgie smugglers. I reckon I haven't seen him wearing too much else. <laughs> nice, mate. I I want to go back to your, to your younger days, and you know, obviously play for. For New Zealand, you're under 19s. You're out of Hutt Valley um, High School. Um, you won, you know, the, the World Player of the Year uh, back then. I mean, that's when guys like, you know, Kieran Reid was obviously part of your squad. Um, but you, you, you celebrated pretty hard, I hear, in the old uh, in, in, in the after match uh, after you'd won the final with the old South African boys. Tell us, tell us a bit about that and being on the turps with the lads. <laughs> yeah, we. Um, I'm lucky enough to get a shout of the ticket to the IIB Awards. It was in, it was London, so they paid for my flight over there, uh, put us up in a nice hotel, and obviously got to win the award, which was um, a pretty awesome, awesome achievement. And then uh, one of the other Kiwi boys uh, also was up for the same award, and we just started to celebrate and ended up at the hotel foyer with the, the South African national team, uh, they just won the uh, IRB team of the year, I think. Oh. So they were all in there and on the beers and the, and the bar. And I think Miko Ali, who was up for the award with us, got on the piano and started singing and, and playing some songs and everyone just started to kick on. And then there was about 10 of the South African boys decided to take it back up to one of their rooms. And it was just, just remember being trays of, uh, Heineken being brought in. <laughs> it was just kind of one of those moments where, as a young fellow, you step back and you're, you're with a few of the guys that you've, you've you know, watched growing up, like a Victor Matfield and a Bucky Bother and Sean Grip, sort of players like that. They're out there, and they start wrestling each other in the room. These are huge, huge men <laughs> yeah. going at it. So you kind of take a step back and think, geez, what am I, what am I doing here? But I just kind of, we just kind of kicked on and enjoyed the night and the festivities. It was, it was a pretty cool experience. Oh, mate, that sounds so good, man. I mean, a few, <laughs> a few years later, you, you'd step into that scene yourself, uh, making your debut, you know, for the All Blacks in, in 2013. You're, you're obviously on the, on the bench, and I mean, how was, how was that for you? And sort of, 
you know, did your did your parents, you know, come to the game? And you know, how did you how did you tell them? You know, first and foremost, that you know you, you you've been named in the All Black squad, but now you have got an opportunity to come off the bench in that first game. Yeah, it was it was. It was a, I guess it was a bit of a whirlwind whole week, really. The first week in camp, um, I was uh, 28 years old when I made the team, so you know, it had been a, bit, a fair bit of years of hard work in uh, New Zealand rugby for a long time. So I, I guess I got in there and was a little bit anxious, and and you know, walking around trying not to stuff anything up or you know, you know, put your best foot forward and. Uh, I guess that week was a little bit nerve-wracking for me. Um, I, we played uh, France at Eden Park, and my brother came over from Melbourne for the game. Uh, my mum and dad were there, and my, my sister was there. And then, uh, unfortunately, I didn't get on. It, was, it must have been a close game, and obviously Steve and, and the coach must have realised that I was probably uh, a little bit nervous and maybe not ready to get on at the stage of... Um, the game it was a little bit tight, so I didn't actually get on that week. But uh, I felt pretty bad for my brother. He'd flown all the way from Melbourne for the game and then uh, went to Christchurch the week after and got about 15, 20 minutes off the, off the bench then. And it was, it was an unreal feeling to get down there. My mum and dad came to that one as well, which is pretty good. And, mate, and, I, and I hear that first game, even though you didn't get on, you, you stitched up your wife a bit too. She, she also came to the game <laughs> in, at Eden Park. <laughs> No, that was that was the Christchurch game. So I, I she was, um, just obviously just we were dating back then, and she would never met the parents. And then I thought, you know, she'd never met your parents. Nah. And then that she, um, I asked if she wanted to come down to the Christchurch game, and she sat down next to mum and dad for the game, um, first time they met her. So oh. I don't know what mum was happier about me playing for the All Blacks or getting to meet my girlfriend for the first time. So. Um, yeah, it's a pretty funny story of how how my wife uh, got to meet my mum and dad. Oh, mate, that's which a heck stuck of... with me. So that's that. That's the one. That's oh, the way to test him, mate. That's the way to test him. Good on you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you also had a method of remembering the line-out calls. I mean, tell us a little bit about that, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, obviously through the hurricanes, I'd always been the one calling the line-out. So you you kind of run through your head before everyone else, so you, you're always switched on and know what's going on. And um, in the ABs, I, I, I didn't call the line outs for them. Um, so it was, a, it was a bit of a stressful time the first game, and so I wrapped my wrist with white tape and, and wrote them down. But by the time I was about to get on, I had pretty smeared and runny, so I had a bit of anxiety and panic attack about not knowing what the calls were going into that into that so um, the plan didn't work too well but I, I, I got through it all right so it was okay oh awesome um you love to keep guys on their toes, and uh, I think James Parsons had mentioned. You I mean you talked about the All Black environment, how daunting that can be, and um, but also you know how fantastic can, it can be as well. But he, he mentioned the uh, the story that uh, he, he you had taught him the wrong hacker, so you had sat there teaching him the wrong hacker. Then he went over and, and uh, tried to uh, replicate that hacker that you had spoken to him about and taught him to to Liam miss him, and apparently Liam almost dropped him that he was just going what the heck is that crap I mean have you, have you got any other stories I, I, I'm not sure I, me and Chipper were rooming together in Scotland and obviously I could uh, sense he was a little bit anxious about the whole the whole thing and I obviously knew I'd been there myself a, a, a few years earlier about you know not wanting to stuff up but I don't know if I actually did teach him the wrong hacker or if that's just what I thought the hacker was <laughs> and I taught him the actions and the words and <laughs> you know, I, I just thought I was doing the right thing and <laughs> maybe my words and actions weren't right. <laughs> um, so uh, after that then mate you've you've gone over to, to Gloucester I mean uh, I mean you have a big big decision to um, you know be able to to go on the I mean, how how was that for 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 the family? Because it's a uh, it's not like New Zealand, is it? In, in Gloucester, it's fairly it's a um, a working men's town with a you know with what's going on, fairly quiet. So, um, was it hard to adapt? It it was. I think the um, first six months was was pretty tricky, and and not from a, a living the lifestyle thing for me personally, but just the way uh, the games played over there. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm not like a, I guess, a, a big tractor uh, Northern Hemisphere 
tight head lock that they, they kind of have in those um, areas of the world. But uh, the more I, I like to use my uh, support play and, and a bit of a more of a skill set to to uh, play the game, and that's how I feel like I, I get into games and, and, then, and get my, um, I guess, um, confidence going forward into a game. And there wasn't a lot of that at the start um, at, at Gloucester and the way we played. So it took a little while to figure out um, how I can kind of build confidence in my game and, and start to feel like, like I'm actually contributing a bit more. So that took me about six months to get uh, around. But then once I got that and, and, and figured out the way, you know, they play the game in the Northern Hemisphere, we, uh, we really enjoyed it and, and loved our time at, at Gloucester. And King's Home, the, the fields are pretty fantastic yeah. place to play. Um, great crowds, great atmosphere. And it is... It is a working, working sort of uh, city, um, you know, like all the spectators and fans spend a lot of their pay packet on getting a season pass or nice. coming away for trips into Europe. So there's, you feel like there's a fair bit of weight on your shoulders to perform because these guys are putting a, a fair bit of their, their money into coming to support us and, and um, you know, encouraging us to, to win games. So, But it's a, I guess that's a pretty cool experience in itself. I mean, I suppose it would have been tough as well. You just had an outstanding season with the Hurricanes. I think, you know, when you got to the final, you are about 13 points ahead of everyone else. You'd already signed to go over to Gloucester. And, you know, obviously you didn't win the final and the Highlanders picked you there. But did that, did, did you want to, did you, did, did you feel like reconsidering going over after, after the, the, the final? Not really. Like, I, 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 I kind of, I'd signed the Christmas before that season had started or just after Christmas. So I'd kind of accepted what was happening and um, it was kind of already had made the plans and was, it was ready to move on sort of after, after that. Um, it was, it was tough. I'd say the last week or so watching the blues play the Hollanders in the trans Tasman competition. Yeah. And they, they brought up the, the Dixon try a fair few times. <laughs> was uh, it a try mate? Was it a try? Um, of course, I'm not going to say it was a try. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so that was a bit tough to watch. But um, you know, yeah, I, I, we had our opportunity to win it in 2015, and unfortunately, we didn't take it. But it was um, very satisfying to see them get back there again the year after and, and win the title. I mean, what what happened that year in 2015? I mean, you, you guys just clicked. I mean, you had Chris Boyd. What what's what was he like as, as as a rugby coach? He's just seemed sort of straight up and down. Has he got a good sense of humour? What was he like to be coached under? Yeah, I, I really enjoyed uh, Boydie. Um, I think he, he obviously had a really clear plan of, of what he wanted to do and, and game plan that suited, the I guess, the, the athletes we had in our team. Uh, he worked really well with his coaches. He brought Plum, Plum in. Yeah. Uh, they worked really well together and, uh, Bordy was probably more of the, the casual um, kind of guy and Plum brought more of the attitude and, and mindset and with being the forwards and defence coach. So um, I guess just their mixture and, and what we had and bringing Ma back and and all that just kind of helped uh, build a fair bit of momentum for us to, to go on and, and play pretty well. Another guy that you had plenty of time for as well. Um, he obviously copped a lot of... Um, you know, Fleck and uh, and in Hurricanes, you know, era was was Mark Hammett, and you know, tell us about about your um, your time with him. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I've got a hell of a lot of time for Hammer um, as a coach. Um, yeah, he obviously uh, copped a fair bit of flack with some of the decisions and choices he made with the team, but I honestly don't think uh, uh, this is me personally that that we would have made the the 2015 final or the 16 final without, um, you know, all the work that he put in and the squad um, that put in before we got to, I guess, have a fair of those glory years. Um, and then personally, just when he signed, I remember talking to him um, on the phone and he was asking why I had been all black and, and all these things. And and he said, you know, if, if, I, if I stay with the Hurricanes and, and Keep playing that. Uh, he'll do everything he can to help push me and get me um, selected to be an All Black. And wow. 
I guess he was uh, true to his word. He helped he helped push my career in the right direction to to have the opportunity to play in the Black Jersey. Hey, that's so good. I mean, um, I want to touch on a couple more things because I know you know we haven't got much time left. But you've scored a few tries. You've already touched on the fact you like the open style of play and you you like to throw the ball around, get it in support. But there's you know one one try that comes to mind, and that's you know, that's in Bloom. It's a heck of a place to go to when you're, you're when you're the travelling <laughs> teammate in 2011. But you're down 47, 43, and you score from about 40 metres, which I suppose by the time you end up in the couple more years, that'll, that'll turn into 50, then 60, then 70 odd metres, mate. How was that <laughs> feeling to win the game with that, with that last minute try, mate? And how are the lungs? Uh, I'll, I'll probably add a chip and chase in there at some stage, <laughs> story, as, as time goes on, but um, the lungs were gone. I think it must, have been, it must have been the last few minutes of the game, I think. Um, but, yeah, it was 40 metres out. I just remember getting the ball down the sideline and I had a young Dane Coles inside me, um, and I knew he had a fair few wheels, so I, I honestly was trying to get the ball to him the whole time, but for some reason, the guy that was defending the both of us kept thinking I was a bigger threat, so he, he kept trying to hold off on me, and every time I dummied, he just kept, um, like, we kept getting closer to the line, and then I just realised I was over the line, and uh, slid in, and by the end of the, by the end, yeah, my lungs are gone, <laughs> I'm playing a floor, um, Every time we used to play at Bournemouth or play against the Cheetahs, the, the games are always really high scoring. So I was pretty bugger by the end of it. Do, do you um, do you miss that style of of, uh, of play? Do you miss, you know, you've had a heck of a, a year, or, you know, and, and also I suppose um, your time at the at the Force and what you've done. But New Zealand rugby is a little bit different. The skill set's different. The mindset's different. I mean, do you often re- reflect back on? You know your time in, in in New Zealand and sort of the the way the game is played, and do, do you miss it? Yeah, you do a bit. I I, I did miss um, a fair bit of it when I was in the UK at times. Um, you know, just some some weeks it could be a fairly big oh, grind yeah. um, in the way you play. Um, but I, I think I'm just more grateful that I had the opportunity to play in New Zealand for so long and for a team I loved and then being able to go overseas and play for a couple of different teams and understand how well, I guess, um, we've got it in New Zealand with the way we play and, and the mindset of, of everyone. I have to say uh, the way we want to play at the fourth, and I, I know it probably didn't look like it at times, but we do... We do want to play a pretty um, entertaining style of footy. Um, I think the way we're going, and if we keep developing the skill sets of the young guys here, then I think we can get close to, to playing a pretty entertaining style of footy where we try to attack from anywhere. Mate, awesome. One last thing, one last question before I let you, let you go, because I know you've got you know, there's some other stories I'd love to get out here, but that's probably another time in Waihi Beach, mate. But... You, you've been in Australia. <laughs> you, you've been in Australia. You've seen it. Do you, do you think they can get, you know, the Wallabies can get, or, and also their, their um, AU competition? In your opinion, do you reckon they can get to a level where the New Zealanders are and actually compete with them over the next, I suppose, couple of years before the Rugby World Cup? I think so. Um, I think uh, it's still still depth is a, is a big thing that the, the, the Kiwi sides have over... Um, the Aussie teams, um, just you know, you see, you saw in um, Super Rugby Trans Tasman, it's a few of the Kiwi teams that about two or three or four frontline players got injured. Um, but the guys that came in and stepped up, you know, like they didn't really make too much of a difference to the team and the way they played. I think the depth in Australia at the moment is probably not as strong as it is in New Zealand. Um, but I think the way the, the Aussie teams are trying to play um, is probably a different style. Um, I think the Brumbies play a bit different to most. Uh, the Reds probably play a bit more like Kiwi teams. We want to try to play a little more like a Kiwi team. Um, if we can keep developing some of these guys coming through in the next two or three years, I think, um, and having someone like Dave Reed, um over here coaching the Wallabies, I think uh, it will make a big difference. Oh, awesome stuff, mate. Hey, thank you so much for your time. As I mentioned, I know you've got a lot of other stories that we perhaps off camera that we can we can talk about a bit bit later on. I want to congratulate you too, mate. You, you've been having an outstanding season. I congratulate you also for another year under the force. And we look forward 
uh, to seeing you back out there and also taking on the coaches reins, mate. But perhaps it might not be a beard growth. You could be losing your hair, mate, with some of those coaches, right? <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> good, on, good on you, Thush, Thushy. Thanks a lot for your time. I really appreciate it, mate. No, thank you. Cheers. Well, there you have it. Another episode of Playmakers. Uh, we we'll look forward to seeing you again sometime soon. Thank you.